Today we're covering the 1889 Fundamentals, especially number 11. Last week we discussed, and in fact the two last weeks we discussed, uh, fundamental number 10, which deals with the ministry of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary as well as the longest time prophecy of the Bible. But now we're covering the 11th fundamental, and this fundamental covers the moral law of God, or the Ten Commandments. And it begins by stating this, that God's moral requirements are the same upon all men in all dispensations, that these are summarily contained in the commandments spoken by Jehovah from Sinai, engraved on the tables of stone and deposited in the ark, which was in consequence called the Ark of the Covenant or Testament, Numbers 10, 33, and Hebrews 9, 4, etc. That this law is immutable and perpetual, being a transcript of the tables deposited in the ark in the true sanctuary on high, which is also for the same reason called the Ark of God's Testament, for under the sounding of the seventh trumpet we are told that the temple of God was open in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the Ark of his Testament, Revelation 11:19. This statement says a lot, and fundamentally we have recorded for all humanity a code of living by which we see enacted out the character of God by all those who are obedient to its precepts, and that this law is eternal. It is registered in heaven inside the sacred ark of the covenant in the temple of heaven. Now, I want to tell you one thing I've learned about this law, and that is that Satan hates it, friends. Satan hates God's law, and he hates God's people, and he wants to destroy both. And he wants to hurt the people of God, friends, because he hates God, and hurting the people of God has the effect of hurting God. Because we know this, in Zechariah chapter 2 and verse 8, if we'd like to turn to Zechariah chapter 2 and verse 8, there we read, For thus saith the Lord of hosts, After the glory hath he sent me unto the nations which spoiled you, for he that toucheth you toucheth the apple of his eye. You've probably heard this expression, she's the apple of, of his eye, or something like that. And, and this is where, where it comes from. And God looks upon his people with tender mercy, friends, and he loves his people. And I also want to tell you that Satan is not finished trying to deceive the world and trying to destroy God's people, trying to bring harm and, and hurt to the heart of God, if you please. In the book of Revelation, we read in chapter 13 about a great beast power. And this beast power is the same as the Antichrist power in Daniel chapter 7. But in Revelation chapter 13, verse 3, we read about this beast power and I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wandered after the beast. In other words, it appears that in many respects on a surface level that Satan is being very successful. He has all of the world, or at least almost all the world, wandering after the beast power and its laws, its rules, its regulations. And Satan does this because he wants you to disregard God's law. Now, friends, we need laws, and laws are good things. Laws can be very helpful. For instance, if you have children attending a school, you're probably glad that there are speed limits in school areas, and you're glad that there are signs that warn people, hey, there's a school ahead, children out, be careful, right? If you were working around a high-voltage area, or just happen to stumble upon a high voltage area, you might be glad for a warning sign. You might even be really glad that someone actually put a fence there because it might keep you from getting hurt, maybe even electrocuted. This is a picture, if you see it, if you're able to see the slides of Mather Point, Mather Point at the Grand Canyon. It's one of the most beautiful views at the Grand Canyon. But you notice something that they have in this picture, and that is a lot of fences. They have fences all around the edge there. Now, we could say those fences are just terrible. They're really bad things. We don't need a fence there. We don't want a fence there. I just want to be able to fall off. It's just fun to drop two or 300 feet and 500 feet and smash myself. Well, no, we know the fence is there for a very good reason, isn't it? It's not a bad thing. It's a, it's a good thing that we have a fence there. It's not a bad thing that we have a fence around a high voltage area. It's not a bad idea to put signs out at school areas or the like, right? We need those kind of things. In Isaiah chapter 24 and verse 5, Isaiah looking down to the stream of time to our day could write this. 
the earth also is defiled under the inhabitants thereof, because they have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinance, broken the everlasting covenant. God says this is a problem, especially at the end of time. And the world is wandering after the beast, and they have transgressed and broken God's law. But God says he's going to have a remnant who will be faithful. And he depicts them in several places, but one place is in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 17. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 17. And there he says that the dragon was wroth with the woman. Now, who is the dragon here? Satan. Satan. The dragon is Satan. The Bible says that very plainly. And he's wroth with the woman, which, is, which represents God's church. And in fact, he goes to make war with the remnant of her seed, which would be the last portion of it, and says that this remnant keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. And so friends, don't think for a minute that God's last day people are going to be people who can just walk in any way they want in disregard to God's law. According to the scriptures, these people who are the remnant of the seed of the woman, they keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. Now, most of us have a, a Seventh-day Adventist background of some kind or another. And so I'm just going to sort of cruise through a, part, a point here real quickly, but I will give you the references. And these references help us to understand that God and God's law have great similar characteristics. In other words, what we're saying is that the law of God is actually a transcript of the character of God. Because we know that God is holy, just, good, perfect. And we have verses here, for instance, in Isaiah 6.3, Revelation 15.3, Psalm 73.1, and Matthew 5.48. That will substantiate that. I'll let you take the notes. You can go back and read them all. We have a lot to cover today, especially near the end, some very vital things concerning God's law, concerning his requirements to us, and issues that are happening right now in our country and in this world. But God's law is also holy, just, good, and perfect. You can read about that in Romans 7.12 and Psalms 19.7. And friends, this is so important to understand because God's righteousness... All of his righteousness is embodied in his law. In Psalms 119 and verse 172, there the psalmist says, My tongue shall speak of thy word, for all thy commandments are righteousness. God is righteous, friends. His commandments are righteous. God is holy. His commandments are holy. God is just. His commandments are just. God is good. His commandments are good. And God is perfect. And the Bible says that the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise is simple. But Satan wants us. He wants us to be void of the righteousness of God. He wants us to sin. Because he knows that sin will keep us out of heaven, friends. Sin will keep us away from God. And us being away from God will hurt the heart of God. In Revelation chapter 21... And verse 27. Revelation chapter 21 and verse 27. It says, And there shall in no wise enter into it, referring to the holy city, anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. Now, friends, things that defile will not go into heaven. And we know that sin defiles, sin brings defilement. That's why someone in the Old Testament, if they had defilement, if they, if they had sinned, they were considered defiled and they had to make an offering, you see. And if we continue to sin, we will not enter into heaven. But of course, that brings up the question, what is sin? That's a big theological question. Did you realize that? One of the most simplest, basic, fundamental truths of the Bible has been taken by theologians and so twisted and, and misconstrued. And you know why? because Satan knows this is so vital and so basic. But the Bible tells us very simply in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 4. 1 John chapter 3, verse 4. There it says, Whosoever committeth sin transgresses also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. Very simply, sin is the transgression of the law. Now, it's true, in this particular text, John does not specifically delineate what kind of law or what law he's talking about here. But, you know, the Bible says that we take a little here, a little there, and that's what we do. And in Romans chapter 7 and verse 7, the Apostle Paul writes, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. 
For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. Now, what law says, Thou shalt not covet? The Ten Commandment law. And so it is the Ten Commandment law that illustrates or shows us what sin is. That's so simple, isn't it? Now, I think at this point, we all understand, I hope we do, and if we don't, we want to make this clear, that keeping the law of itself cannot save us. The Bible tells us that we are saved by grace through faith. And you know the text, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, right? Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Beloved, I want to say something. I want to make this so clear it cannot ever be misunderstood. Jesus did not die to save us to continue in sin, but that we might be forgiven and walk in obedience to his law. By his death, friends, we are under a double obligation to obey him. He is our creator. We are under obligation to obey him because he's our creator. But because we have sinned and he has bought us back and he is our redeemer, we are under a second obligation, as it were, to obey him. Notice in Romans chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. Romans 6, 1 and 2. The Apostle Paul says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? It is true, friends, that there is a common teaching in much of professed Christianity today that says that because we are under grace, it, we don't have to keep God's law. We can just continue in sin. But the Apostle Paul says, God forbid that. And he says, if we are dead to sin, we cannot live any longer therein. I don't know about you, but I've seen some dead people. I used to thought I saw a lot of them until my daughter became a paramedic. And she's seen a lot more than I have now. But one thing I can tell you about dead people is that they're totally unresponsive to anything you do to them. You can push them, prick them with a pin, slap them. They're not going to respond back if they're dead. And friends, if we will truly be dead to sin, if we understand how bad sin is and learn to hate sin so much that we are dead to it, then when sin comes tempting us, it's not going to be so hard to quit and to lay it aside. The Apostle Paul also says in Romans chapter 3 and verse 31, Do we then make void the law through faith? He says, God forbid, yea, we establish the law. Why? Christ's death doesn't abrogate the law. It doesn't do away with the law of God. It establishes the law of God, beloved. It establishes it. It shows how firm it is and how immutable it is. Because if it could be changed, Jesus didn't have to die to save us, friends. He could just change the law, giving us a different requirement. But he didn't do that. Can you imagine a man who's been pardoned for a capital crime, deciding that since he's been pardoned, he is now free to continue to rape, kill, or hurt others more? No, he should be very thankful to the governor who has pardoned him and pledged to obey the laws of the land. He should love that governor. But you know, today our world doesn't understand love very much. Love is, is such a shallow thing. Have you ever seen the little badge that says, wave if you love Jesus? Wave if you love Jesus. Or the bumper sticker, honk if you love Jesus. You've seen that probably. Someone's come up with a new version of it. It says, honk if you love Jesus. Keep texting if you want to meet him. Well, how about sing if you love Jesus? Yeah, we can sing if you love Jesus. We even sing the song, Oh, How I Love Jesus. I, saw the, I, I couldn't believe this one. This one says, if you love Jesus, moo like a cow. It's a kid's book. If you love Jesus, make the moo sound. But you know what Jesus said? You know what Jesus said? In John chapter 14, verse 15, Jesus said, if you love me, don't wave, don't honk, don't sing, don't moo like a cow, and don't text while you drive. That's a good idea too. But he says, if you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, keep mine commandments. In Mark chapter 12, Jesus expressed here, speaking to a scribe who came to him one day, the importance of the commandments of God and how the whole duty of man is wrapped up in them. In Mark chapter 12, verses 28 and 29, it says, And one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, 
and perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, which is the first commandment of all? And Jesus answered him, the first of all commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Now what verse is he quoting from? Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4, the Shema of Israel. But it continues, and Jesus continues quoting it in verse 30. He continues now quoting Deuteronomy 6, 5. And he says, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And the second, he says in verse 31, is like, namely this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. Jesus is showing us that the whole duty of man, which comprises his duty to God, and his duty to his fellow man, is comprised within the Ten Commandments. The first four commandments deal with our duty to God, specifically, and the last six commandments deal with our duty to our fellow neighbor. And of course, the first duty we have is to love God supremely, and the second is to love our neighbor as ourselves. Now, why is it, though, that we need this moral code? Why is it that we need this Ten Commandment law? Well, in Romans chapter 7, and verse 7. And we read this earlier, but let's notice it again. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? He says, God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law, for I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. In other words, friends, if there wasn't a Ten Commandment law, we wouldn't know what sin was. If you didn't have a copy of the law, if you didn't have some way to know what the law was, you would know what sin is. That'd be a pretty bad thing. How many times have every one of us, at one point in our life or another, been working, doing some kind of project or, or process, and maybe we've had a, 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 an ink pen with us, or we've had some grease or oil or something, and we think we've contained everything to what we're doing, and we're clean, and we come inside, or someone looks at us, and we, we, we either have the report from someone else, or we see ourselves in the mirror, and we see, oh, there's a big piece of grease on my cheek. Had no idea it was there, right? And so sometimes we can be very self-deceived. We may think we're fine, but friends, we need to look into the, into the law of God and we will understand our sinfulness when we do that. We just wouldn't know that we are sinners without the law. And it points us to the foot of the cross as the solution for our sin. The law of God is like a mirror. That mirror cannot clean me, but it can show me I'm dirty and need cleaning. Notice how James speaks about the law of God here in James chapter 1, verses 22 through 24 first. He says, But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. In other words, he's saying, don't be a hypocrite, man. He says, do it. Verse 23, For if any be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. Verse 24, for he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But then in verse 25, James says, But whosoever looketh into the perfect, what kind of law? Perfect law of liberty, and, it's not enough just to look into it, is it? And continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. So friends, the idea that we can avoid being obedient to the law of God is just a big fat lie of the devil. According to the word of God, we must look into this law of liberty and we must continue in it. That's what the word of God says. Now, Jesus understood this well. And Jesus came with a purpose. He came to die for man, yes, but he did more than just that. He came to show us what God's law was like, to teach us and to magnify it. In Isaiah chapter 42 and verse 21, Isaiah chapter 42 and verse 21, it says that the Lord is well pleased for his righteousness sake. He will magnify the law and make it honorable. He will magnify it and make it honorable. Jesus would make it great. He would clarify it. He would show its true import. He would help us to see how deep it really was. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus spoke about the law of God. And in Matthew chapter 5 and verses 17 through 19, Jesus said, Think not 
that I'm come to destroy the law or the prophets. He says, don't think that for a minute. I'm not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Now, it doesn't mean that those people who are, who are saying that we can break the commandments of God are the least in the kingdom of heaven. It's the ones in the kingdom of heaven are calling them the least. Let's make sure we understand that. And the ones who are doing the word of God, they're the ones who, by the people in heaven, are being called great in the kingdom of God. Friends, Jesus didn't come to destroy the law. He came to establish the law. He said, till heaven and earth pass, not a crossing of the T or a dotting of the I would pass from God's law. Now, God knows that we have really messed up. God knows each one of us have messed up, friends. And yet, he doesn't give up on us because he knows that by his grace, we can change. And he wants us to change. In Romans chapter 12, in verse 2, we are in fact commanded to change. And there's two words here I want you to notice, two verbs. He says, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, the words in this verse, conformed and transformed, sound a little alike, don't they? But in the original language, both of these are imperatives. They're in an imperative form. This is something that must be done. Well, the first one is actually something that must not be done because it has a negative in front of it, the not. So you're not to be conformed to this world, but rather you be transformed. And that we'll be transformed by the renewing of our mind. When Jesus comes, friends, we'll be translated and our flesh will be changed. But before our flesh can be changed at the coming of Jesus, we have to have a renewing of our mind. We have to have this transforming of our mind, this metamorpho, if you please, of our mind. And God has promised to do this for us. In Titus chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, Titus 2, 11 and 12, he says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly, in this present world. This is not an experience, friends, that's reserved for heaven. In fact, it's a requirement to enter into heaven. And God's law is a central focus piece of the new covenant experience. In Hebrews chapter 8, and verses 8 and 9, we'll begin. He's making reference here to Jeremiah. And he says, For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Verse 9, Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continue not my covenant, and I regard them not, saith the Lord. So what are you going to do, God? Well, in the next verse, in verse 10, he says, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will eliminate my law and just give them grace to walk in. Is that what it says? No, he doesn't say that, does he? He says, I will put my laws in their mind and write them in their hearts and I will be to them a God and they shall be to me a people. Friends, the old covenant and the new covenant were both based upon the same law of God. The first was written upon tables of stone. The second is to be written in our hearts, in the fleshly tables of our hearts. And with God giving us the, the, the motivation and the empowerment to keep those commandments. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, and reading verses 3 through 5, the Apostle Paul says, For as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, and notice, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of the heart. And such trust have we through Christ to Godward, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, 
but our sufficiency is of God. You know, I can't write God's law in my heart, and you can't write God's law in your heart either. I can't keep God's law in myself, and neither can you. But our sufficiency is not of ourselves. Our sufficiency is of who? It's of God. It's of God. And remember, we read in Romans chapter 3, and verse 31 earlier, that we are not to make void the law of God. The new covenant doesn't make void the law of God. The new covenant establishes the law of God. Unless you want to believe that Paul was preaching and teaching the old covenant. Because Paul says we don't get rid of the law of God. We establish the law of God. And I don't think Paul was teaching the old covenant. Again, friends, remember that the law declares unto us what sin is. And if there is no law, then there's no sin. Right? Think about that. If there's no law, there's no sin. Why do we need grace? Why do we need grace? Because we have sinned. If there's no law, there's no sin. But if there's no sin, there's no grace, is there? You see how the devil wants to do this? He wants to get rid of God's law because in doing so, he, he helps to eliminate grace from the believer's life. Mm -hmm. It's very plain. Now again, the law of God cannot save us, but it points out sin. It points us to our need of Jesus Christ who can save us from sin. The law gives us a standard, something real for our lives to be changed into. Now, the devil has a vicegerent upon this world. Who is the devil's vicegerent? Who can tell me? Say it again. The Pope. The Pope. That's right. The Pope is his vicegerent. It is his personal representative on earth, we are told. And he has tried to change God's law, right? Now, in the Old Testament book of Hosea, chapter 4 and verse 6, you're familiar with the text, I'm sure, Hosea 4, 6. He says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee. Friends, if we reject the truth, God cannot save us into his kingdom. But there are many people who are today deceived about the truth of God. They're deceived about the truth of God's law. And they're deceived especially about the Sabbath of God's law. And God doesn't want them dece deceived. And so he has commissioned a group of people to give what he has called, what we call the three angels' messages. Those three messages of Revelation chapter 14. And this must be done because this beast power, this vicegerent of Satan, has tried to trample upon God's law. But friends, if you want to continue to live in sin and ignorance, you can do that. God is not a God of force in the sense that he will make you obey him. But you will finally be lost. You will finally be lost and you need to understand that. Now the issue that we're really considering here is not the issue of law versus grace. These are not setting counter distinction to each other. It is law and grace together. They are complementary. They work together. It's not law versus grace, but it is obedience with forgiveness. And grace. In Revelation chapter 12 and verse 17, again, the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which what? Keep. Keep the commandments of God. And they have the testimony of Jesus. And this is repeated in a similar way later on in the end of the third angel's message in Revelation 14 and verse 12. He says, Here's the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have what? The faith of Jesus. So keeping the commandments of God doesn't get rid of faith. It doesn't get rid of grace. It establishes it. it. It helps it to be a part of our lives. But Satan, again, through his vicegerent, through his personal representative, through the beast power, through the Antichrist, if you please, it wants to change God's law because he wants our minds off of Jesus. Now, today, I ask you the question. Is the whole world wandering after the devil through his agency, the beast? Yes. yes, we see that and we read about in Revelation chapter 13 and verse 3. Now I want you to keep that in mind and we're going to read something that Paul wrote in Romans chapter 6 and verse 16 because he lays out a principle and this principle is vital to us in this particular area and in some things that are happening to us right now in current events. Romans 6, 16. He says, Know ye not, don't you know? Don't you get it? You ever hear people say, don't you get it? Do you get it? Paul is saying to us, in fact, don't you get it? That to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. So it's the one that we obey, we become 
their servants. If we obey the law of the beast, or the image of the beast, or their laws, and they contradict the law of God, then friends, we are their servants and not the servants of Jehovah anymore. How true the following prophecy must be today in Psalms 119 and verse 126. Psalms 119 and verse 126. He says, It is time for thee, Lord, to work, for they have made void thy law. We see that today. And friends, even in the United States, let alone God's holy moral standard, we are seeing a lessening of just law, the concept of law in general. We're going to defund the police. We're going to just let people do anything and call them silent, peaceful protesters when they're tearing up things. Beloved, the time is here and now. The law of God especially has been made void. Now, we can either have God or the beast, right? We have a choice. We can have God or the beast. We can accept the word of God, the Bible, or we can take the traditions and the teachings of men. We can have the pleasure of God or the love of the world. You know, do you want God's approbation or the world's approbation? We can either stay with God's eternal, unchangeable law or the papal changed law. And again, remember that the one that you yield yourselves servants to obey, that's the one whose servants you are. Now I'm going to seemingly digress from our subject for just a minute, but not in reality. Maybe today we are yielding to tobacco or some form of health-destroying habit. We are killing ourselves, if you please, on the installment plan. It is a type of slow suicide and a violation of the Sixth Commandment. But what does the Bible say about our bodies? In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, it says, Know ye not that ye, ye is plural, he's speaking to all of us as Christians, that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. In fact, beloved, the scripture teaches us that the care of the body is part of our religious duty. Religious duty. Especially in light of the second coming of Christ. I want you to know something the Apostle Paul said about it in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 23. Notice the, if you please, holistic approach that Paul has. 1 Thessalonians 5.23. He says, And the very God of peace sanctify you how? Holy. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now I have to ask you a very fundamental question. Fundamental question. To whom has God committed the responsibility of caring for our body temples? Us as individuals, right? Has he committed that responsibility to Caesar, to the state? Or has he committed it to you? If he has committed it to the individual, then the state has no right to use coercive power, no, no right to use coercive power of the law in this matter. The state is infringing upon God's right to delegate authority as he sees fit. Now, interestingly, we've been talking about the law of God today. And the next thing that we're going to be talking about after we finish the law of God is the Sabbath. And the Sabbath is actually connected to this issue that we're talking about. Why? Why does God get authority over our lives physically, mentally, and spiritually, I ask, why? He's our creator. He is our creator. And in fact, he's not only our creator, but he's our, our redeemer. He's the one who saves us. So we have a double obligation to obey him, to allow him to have authority over our lives. And that is the whole life that Paul speaks about. He says, you know, your body, soul, spirit, everything. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. What is the sign by which we recognize God as the creator? Sabbath. The Sabbath. And what is the sign that we recognize God as the Redeemer by? Sabbath. The Sabbath as well. Are you seeing a connection here yet? Mm -hmm. It is exactly the seventh-day Sabbath. 
And friends, when we surrender the responsibility of our bodies away from God to Caesar or to an employer, it is a denial of God as the creator. And this is being used today with the COVID-19 issue crisis vaccination situation is being used to prepare humanity for the full assault against God's law and the Sabbath during the mark of the beast crisis. Now, I'm not standing here today as a health professional. I took my white coat off earlier this morning from the experiment. And I'm not at this point, at this time, arguing for or against vaccination. We can have that discussion. I think it's worthy of discussion. But what I am stating is that according to the Bible, according to the Word of God, the one we obey becomes our master. Hmm. Romans chapter 6 and verse what? 16. 16. Think about that. The one we obey becomes our master. And Jesus said you can't serve God and mammon. He says you can't have two masters. Hmm. Think about that, friends. So should Seventh-day Adventists support the proposed vaccination mandate? No, friends. No. Let me be clear. The Bible forbids us to do so. Now, I'm not saying that you can't get vaccinated. That that's your choice. I'm not saying it's the right or the wrong choice today. That's not the point I'm making. So let's not get off on a tangent on that and be, be too concerned on that right now. The point I'm making is that no one has a right to tell you how to take care of your body and what to do with it. It's true. We, we give people counsel and advice all the time, don't we? We have a health message. We counsel people, but we never try to force people or coerce them. We never try to make them do a certain thing. The Bible indeed forbids us. And you might be thinking at this point, you know, I read something in the book Desire of Ages on page 89. It's on paragraph 4. That Jesus did not contend for his rights. And you might be asking the question, why aren't you contending for your rights in this situation? But beloved, we need to understand this is not about our rights. This is not about our rights. No, it's about God's right as our creator, and his rights must not be trampled underfoot by Caesar, the state, an employer, or anyone else. We are to obey and honor God first and foremost. And you might think this is a minor point. You might think it's just one little point, but I want to tell you something, friends. God's word says in James chapter 2, verse 10, for whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. He is guilty of all. And remember, we read Matthew 5, 18 about not one jot or one tittle is to be removed. People wonder why worship in the corporate Seventh-day Adventist church today is so lifeless and seemingly meaningless. Well, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 15 and verse 9, But in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. We want to have an understanding of why it seems to be so vain today. It's because they're doing the commandments of men. They're taking the precepts and the traditions of men. They're, they're, they're lining up with the politically correct wokeness of the godless, atheistic, left-wing society today. Mm-hmm. And their vain is, worship is vain. Recently, the Florida Advent Health System issued a deadline for its workers. It has 36,000 employees, by the way to have their first vaccination shot by at least December the 6th and a booster by January the 4th, or they must lose their jobs. And by the way, the day January 4th, what other date coincides with that? Do you remember? The date when Biden's vaccination mandate, at least originally, was designed to go into effect. Now, in some of the the vaccination laws, I just want to cover a point that I think is important. Because it, does, it goes back to God's law also. And that is the idea. Well, you know, Brother Allen, um, they're giving us an exemption. If we have a religious issue or some kind of medical condition, they will allow us to have an exemption. We can apply for exemption. And maybe we only have to be tested once a week or we have to have a certain protocol. But, but at least there's an exemption. But I want to remind you about a little history and a lesson from history. There was a national Sunday law proposed that A.T. Jones spoke in the United States Senate about. Do you remember? When was that? Does anybody remember? 1888. 1888. 
And, and, he, and he spoke before the, the committee there in front of especially a senator by the name of Blair, Senator Blair. And all this has been recorded historically for you, and it's been published in the little book, National Sunday Law. Some of you have seen a copy of it, right? But I wanted you to notice just a little bit of the dialogue that occurred in that discussion. There's another point, and that is that we will be sufferers under such a law when it is passed. They propose to put in an exemption clause. Now, let me just stop here. There was a Seventh-day Baptist minister there by the name of Lewis. And he was not having any problem with this law as long as they would put in an exemption for Sabbath keepers. Okay? So this is what Jones is talking about when he says this, the exemption clause. He says some of them favor an exemption clause. But it would not in the least degree check our opposition to the law if 40 exemption clauses were put in unless, indeed, they should insert a clause exempting everybody who does not want to keep it. In that case, we might not object so much. <laughs> Senator Blair then responded, you care not whether it is put in or not? Probably maybe a little surprised. Jones responded, there is no right whatever in the legislation and we will never accept an exemption clause as an equivalent to our opposition to the law. It is not to obtain relief for ourselves that we oppose the law. It is the principle, the whole subject of the legislation to which we object. And an exemption clause would not modify our objection in the least. He's saying that the law is evil. Mm -hmm. The law is evil. Mm -hmm. And we object to it by very principle, whether we suffer or not. Even if we don't suffer, we object to the law because it's wrong. Blair said, you differ from Dr. Lewis. Now, Dr. Lewis was the Seventh-day Baptist guy. Jones says, yes, sir, we will never accept an exemption clause as tending in the least to modify our opposition to the law. And he doesn't say that if, if, if that's what they have to do, that they wouldn't use an exemption. He didn't say it was wrong to do. But he says, we won't use an exemption as um, in the least to modify our opposition to the law. He says, we as firmly and fully deny the right of the state to legislate upon the subject with an exemption clause as without. And, and Jones went on to say that, I, well, maybe I have it. No, I don't have it. But Jones went on to say that the law is evil and you don't need an, an exemption from an evil law. You shouldn't even have an evil law, you see. And anything that causes us to give our allegiance to someone other than Jehovah, friends, is an evil law. And when God has given me the responsibility to take care of my own body, the temple of his uh, of spirit, it's not someone else's responsibility to force or coerce me to do it in a different way than I feel responsibility to God to do it. Ever hear of someone by the name of Ted Wilson? Yeah. Ted Wilson. He's the <laughs> Seventh-day Adventist General Conference president. And uh, he was recently in the Philippines. Just recently. Just this last week. And he was there. This is his first international trip since all the COVID stuff blew up. And so he goes to the Philippines first. And he meets there with uh, President uh, Durte. And uh, there's, there's a, a news note here. And I'm going to share. This is from an Adventist News World uh, Release Center. And so you, this is not just someone's hearsay. But it says, Wilson, who led an Adventist delegation to Malacana Palace, also expressed appreciation to Durte for supporting, notice, religious liberty, promoting, for, for supporting religious liberty, promoting healthy life choices, and demonstrating the reconciling ministry of Jesus and granting an amnesty to former rebels who have laid down their arms after hearing the gospel through Adventist World Radio. I don't know if you got that or not, but Wilson's commending him first for supporting religious liberty, mm. promoting what he thinks are healthy lifestyle choices. Now, Durte is, what is he promoting on life, life, healthy lifestyle choices right now in the Philippines? What is he promoting? He's promoting mandated vaccination of everyone. What is he supporting for religious liberty right now? They have, they have pressured, they are pressuring currently right now, the central government, the president's office is, is pressing and I know this because this is a direct report from Pastor David Sims, who's living in the Philippines now, knows that what they're doing, instead of issuing one decree law from the top, they're putting pressure on all the local governments 
to prohibit anyone from going into town and buying and selling if they're not vaccinated. Not only that, if you're not vaccinated, you're not allowed to go out of your house on Saturdays. On Saturdays. Oh, what, what day is the Sabbath? Saturday. What we commonly call Saturday. In other words, friends, it prohibits the people from getting together to worship. It prohibits the people from buying or selling. But the general conference president is there. He's supporting the Filipinos president's religious liberty teachings, his healthy lifestyle choices, etc. I, I just tell you, that is just, that is so, so wrong, so terrible. And they just act like it was a great thing that he went there and he got to share the gospel with the president. The president was just so impressed with him. We're sure the president's impressed with him. He's saying, you're just doing a great job. Keep doing it. <clears throat> well, I want to share with you a statement, and this statement is from Testimonies for the Church, Volume 1, page 353, paragraph 4, and I've broken it up into three sections. Because sometimes we may be tempted to think that the mark of the beast issue is simply about having to go to church on Sunday, but it's more than that. It's more than that. Notice what we are told here. I saw that God will in a wonderful manner preserve his people through the time of trouble. Amen to that? Mm -hmm. As Jesus poured out his soul in agony in the garden, they will earnestly cry and agonize day and night for what? Deliverance. Deliverance. Now notice this next part. The decree will go forth that they must disregard the Sabbath of the fourth commandment and honor the first day or lose their lives. Let me just stop there for a minute. It doesn't say simply that we must honor the first day of the week only. What must also be done? A disregard of the fourth commandment. A disregard of Sabbath worship. So, it's, friends, it's not a situation where we can have our cake and eat it too. It's not going to be like where we can say, well, we'll go ahead and keep Sabbath, but we'll go to church on Sunday just, you know, to keep peace. No, they're not going to let you have Sabbath worship, friends. The decree will go forth that they must disregard the Sabbath of the fourth commandment and honor the first day of the week, or lose their lives. But they will not yield and trample under their feet the Sabbath of the Lord and honor an institution of papacy. Satan's hosts and wicked men will surround them and exalt over them because there will seem to be no way of escape for them. But in the midst of their revelry and triumph, there is heard peal upon peal of the loudest thunder, the heavens have gathered blackness and are only illuminated by the blazing light and terrible glory from heaven as God utters his voice from his holy habitation. So friends, we have a choice. We have a choice. And whoever we choose to serve, we will be that, that one's service. And God has given us his holy law and we are to serve him. And in Matthew chapter 19 and verse 17, Jesus Ask the question, why callest thou me good? Because remember, man came and said, Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He says, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, do what? Keep the commandments. Keep the commandments. And in Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 9, he says, And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that what? Obey him. Friends, I want salvation, don't you today? Amen. I want, I want the eternal salvation of Jesus, and I want to have a conscience clear. And again, I'm not telling you how you should have to control your own health and what you need to do at this time of crisis right now. But I am telling you this, that no one has a right to coerce you or make you do one thing or another. You know, there's a lot of our people who are, are dead set against vaccination. I just might be one of them. But I have no right to coerce someone else to not be vaccinated any more than the state has a right to coerce someone to be vaccinated. Mm -hmm. You see? Because we're all going to give an account to God for ourselves. We certainly want to make the most intelligent, biblically informed decision we can, right? But friends, no one has an opportunity under God's eyes to do that for you. You make these decisions, and you're going to make the decision, friends, whether you're going to honor God's Sabbath or whether you're going to accept the mark of the beast. And the choice will be yours. And God will give you that choice. And God's going to let you either live eternally or he's going to let you be destroyed and never more again. The choice is yours. 
Friends, I think of, 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 of the, the call that they gave in the Old Testament, you know, choose life, choose life. You won't be sorry. As for me and my house, we'll choose the Lord. What about you? Amen. Thank you for being with us today. Until next time, may God bless you lots and lots and lots. Thank you.